Testing. Okay, excellent. Good. Let's, uh, let's see. I, I did not say that, web captioner. I said, let's see. Okay.
Apparently there's a new one. Everybody, there's a new king in town. Get ready. Mojo, 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 king, baby! <laughs> Yeah, uh, just a spectacular, uh, one of my favorite games of all time, uh, Guitaru Man. Not Guitar Hero, Guitaru Man. And it's not an uh, off-brand clone of Guitar Hero either. It is a very unique rhythm game uh, with a, an exceptional sense of style and character to it and a very diverse set of uh, musical tracks to play to. Um, it was made by the same people who made uh, Osu, uh, Osu Tatake Wendan, uh, and Elite Beat Agents. Uh, Enos, a, uh, an incredible studio, uh, who unfortunately uh, uh, did not survive uh, the last decade. Uh, so it's very sad. They will live on in memory. Um, so let's uh, let's keep going here. <coughs> okay. So in, in fact, let's not keep going. Let's get going. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope that you are having a great time with Project 2. Uh, from those I've talked to, it sounds like you're into it. It sounds like you're having a pretty good time. Uh, the ability to kind of exercise your creative talents fully to explore the design space of whatever fun, funky idea that you've got in your head. Uh, it's a really, really fun time in the course. So I hope you enjoy. Um, uh, we've got a, a, a big batch of announcements today. Uh, and then we are going to get into a topic that we've talked about a little bit, hinted at a little bit in the course. It's called juice, okay? Uh, and it is something that you will want to start putting into your games. Uh, it is one of the most impactful and important things you can have in a game uh, to make it feel alive and full of character and personality and playfulness. You know, if you've played a lot of games, you might think to yourself, you know what, I'm already liking this game, this new game I just bought and I'm not even through the menus yet. And you ask yourself why. Well, people can do things that even bring their very menus to life, right? Get you excited, get you into it, get you immersed. Um, and so we're going to talk to you about a few techniques today. Uh, and we're going to do a big workshop on implementing some of these techniques in front of you on the screen here. Um, that should help out, okay? Make things springy, make things juicy, make things elastic, full of energy and fun. 
Um, so I've got a bunch of announcements for you today, though. Uh, your inspiration for the week. <clears throat> this is a, a, a top-tier GIF right here, right? It is uh, on the topic of refactoring, right? When you go to improve some code, when you think that you found some code that is redundant and you want to get rid of it to decrease the bug surface, uh, to uh, reduce the size of your code, to make it all more elegant, easier to manage, less bug-prone, so you delete something and then all of a sudden your entire project falls apart, right? This is a sign, of course, of tight and nasty coupling between your systems. When you remove something and something seemingly unrelated, something that should be unrelated totally stops working, uh, that means you've got a nasty, nasty coupling infestation in your code base. And you've got you to gotta get into your code base, you've got to take the parts of it, and you've got gotta to let them, you have to fix them so that they work alone in isolation better so that they are less coupled to each other so that they can survive and do their jobs even when pieces of your code base are missing okay uh, that's a pretty good sign that you've got a nice decoupled code base it's going to be easy to test right isolate the system feed it custom data to try and break it so easier to test and mock um, and then easier to reason about too okay and, e and often easier to scale Anyway, it's a fun time. The reason this GIF is, is very relevant right now is because from your P1 postmortems, uh, and the grades just released for that, uh, it was very clear that many of you kind of, you know, you started off with some plans to, to keep your code base very um, heavy on components, very modular, very isolated, and then it, that kind of falls apart in the rush, right? With the deadlines being as tight as they are, you have to make sacrifices. That causes your code base to get a bit more spaghettified uh, and more coupled. Um, and so on your P2, right, you are away from your P1 code base. This is your first big break, your first big chance to create a new code base with what you learned in Project 1. One of the reasons that Project 1 is as tightly deadlined as it is, with as much time pressure as it is, is because the effects, the impact of a nasty, unscalable code base you don't feel them as much if you have a lot of time on your project, right? Maybe you're in a 281 project and you start early enough so you've got a lot of time and you, you know, you've got some nasty coding practices but they don't really hurt you as much, right? They're not as big of a deal and so, nah, you don't really learn that much. Um, maybe. You learn a ton from 281. Incredible class, but maybe the scaling issues in terms of dev time don't hit you as hard. On Project 1, they absolutely do. So I want you to have that memory. I want you to feel the burn a little bit of how a spaghettified, coupled code base burns you in the long run. I want you to have that memory as you go into P2 and P3 uh, so that you can make the hard choices and invest more time up front uh, to get your architecture scaling before you invest in a lot of content. Okay? Um, so let's keep going. Uh, P2 Gold Spike grading warning. P2 Gold Spike, if you look at our schedule, is going to be due on Wednesday. So you've got a couple more days for that. And in fact, uh, I'll send out a Piazza post, but on Wednesday, we're not going to have a normal lecture. Uh, you will be spending those two hours playing other games that you are assigned, and you'll be recording footage of your playthrough using a tool like OBS. Okay, um, And you'll be getting a bunch of feedback and, and, and video footage of your game being played too. Um, anyway, so it's currently Monday. We are in the middle of Gold Spike and research and project management. Your research and your Gold Spike are due on Wednesday, okay? One of the biggest caught losses of points for P2 Gold Spike every semester um, is with the goldspike.txt document, okay? That document is for you to tell us what your one, one, singular, Gold Spike mechanic is. Do not just put the log line or pitch for your entire game in that document. Otherwise, we can't judge if you got your gold spike done, you're getting no points, okay? Uh, so please do that. Uh, please read the spec. It goes over this. It bolds it, highlights it, underlines it. Uh, just do what the spec says. Read it carefully, okay? Um, so P1 peer evaluation is currently being graded and evaluated, and most teams did a great job of working together, being productive, everyone contributing. Um, unfortunately, there were a few cases where that was not the case, uh, and it's very disappointing. I have to tell you, um, in case this was not obvious, it is not okay to leave your tasks until the final day or two uh, before a deadline. That is not fair to your team. That's not respectful. It's also not practical. How can you merge stuff in 
uh, to your team's code base. How can you test appropriately if you're submitting code 30 minutes before the deadline? It's not fair to your teammates uh, and you will be punished for doing this, okay? So please be thoughtful if you've done this a few times. Please fix your, your habits, okay? Um, schedules are permitting, right? Okay, so teams tend to work best, and keep this in mind for your project three, uh, teams tend to work best when the schedules for everyone involved are kind of not necessarily synced, but permitting, okay? And by that, I mean everyone has enough time in their schedule to contribute relatively equally. So if you have a team of three people uh, who, you know, they have, they have a bit of time, they don't have a they don't have all that much time to contribute to the game. And one person or two people uh, who have a ton of time to contribute and they just pour investment into the game. Well, it's, it's not your fault, right, for not having enough time in your schedule. Not really. But there's still going to be animosity that builds up, right? The level of contribution is just not going to be the same probably. And no matter how much you talk about it and how, no matter how much all of you understand how much each member can contribute, it's not the same. So you're going to have a little bit of animosity build up eventually, uh, and that's not going to be productive, okay? Um, skills are complementary, right? So one of the best things that you can find when you're looking for teammates are people who cover for your own weaknesses. You got to know what your weaknesses are, right? So when I'm working on a game at my studio, whether it's an educational game for the government, whether it's our own internal IP, doesn't matter, um, you'll never find me doing the artwork for my games, right? Because I am not very good at that. I can do it a little bit uh, and it can be okay, but it's just not fast. It's not productive, right? It's not a good use of time. And so my team is filled with artists. I usually have several artists working on my projects and a musician, and then I handle the design and engineering work, right? You want to find team members. Now we're, we're all engineers in this course. However, we don't necessarily specialize in the same thing, right? If, if, if you did all of the weapons on project one, it might be a good idea if you found someone who did all of the enemies, right? Who has a background already in how to do AI in a Unity context. Um, and likewise, when you get onto your project, you might all start with a very general similar skill set. But specialization is extremely helpful, right? If you have a bug in your AI system, you don't really want the person who did all of your great UI to be solving that bug. They can probably do it, but it's not going to be efficient, okay? You want to make sure the right challenges are routed to the right member of your team, okay? It can be really, really great to have a general and well-rounded education, and you've all gone through a fantastic computer science program to ensure that's the case. However, when you get onto a real deal team that wants to be productive and efficient and you want to make impact, specialization is what happens, okay? Um, unless you're at a startup, in which case people specialize in a ton of different things and you wear a bunch of hats. Have I told you the story of the hand guy chat? Have I told you the uh, have I told you the story of the hand guy at Visceral Games, EA Visceral Games? Have I told you that story, chat? I feel like an old man. I'm only 27. I feel like an old man when I go on these tangents like this, but it's a fantastic story. Okay, so. When I was at Visceral Games, uh, no, I was not at Visceral, I was a floor underneath them at Maxis, 2014-2015, working on the Sims franchise. And above us uh, was Visceral Games, who at the time was working on Call of Duty uh, Hardline. Uh, and uh, it was an awesome game. Uh, and however, there was one guy, I forget his name, but there was one guy at Visceral Games. The studio had been around for quite a while, and he was known as the hand guy, the guy who only ever worked on hands, okay? He only ever worked on hands, rigging, rigging hands, texturing hands, right? Um, modeling hands, creating the meshes, and animating hands. If you needed hands, he was your one-stop shop, and he was one of the best in the industry at hands, okay? But he was on like a 300-person team and so that was his niche, his day, right? You know, from, from uh, 11 uh, a.m. in the morning to like, you know, 8 or 9 p.m. at night uh, when they went home was working on hands, all right? And that is the kind of specialization that allows you to create an incredible game that just succeeds in so many different ways. It has great hands. It has, it has great power-ups. It has great smoke and particle effects. However... 
if that doesn't sound like a good time to you, and that does not sound like a good time to me, that's why I'm not still at AAA Studios. Um, the I okay, so you are going to be specialized, right? If you go to a startup instead, you're on a much smaller team, which means you are doing a lot more stuff, which means you're getting knowledge in many different areas. You're not specializing as much, so the very low chance you're going to hit the same level of quality you would if you specialized. But the learning experience is much more interesting, and the day-to-day is much more interesting. Some people feel the opposite. But that's something you should think about, not only if you want to go into the game industry, right? Do you want a large team where you're going to be super specialized, a medium-level team where you're doing a few different things, owning a few different systems, or a startup studio where you are doing all the things? Um, But if you go to another job, right? Uh, if you go to Facebook, there's a very good chance you're going to be specializing there. If you go to Google, you're going to specialize there too. Uh, and it, but if you go work for a startup in downtown Ann Arbor, a small team, you're probably going to be you know, managing some security, doing some back end, doing some UI, front end. It's something that you need to start thinking about when you decide to choose your team. Because how you choose not only who's on your team, but your team size is going to control the experience that you have, okay? Um, so anyway, this is something that you should think about. Sorry for the tangent, let's keep going. We got a lot to do today. Um, so da, 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 skills are complementary. Also, you wanna make sure that your objectives are aligned on any team you're on, okay? So you, uh, when, you know, when you get onto a team, you know, when you get onto your P3 team, You know, you might be someone who really wants to go in the game industry, and this needs to be a knockout project. It's going to be the shining gem of your portfolio, right? And maybe you've decided you want to invest a special amount of time, right, way beyond the call of duty uh, into this this project, right? You can do that if you want to. You don't need to, okay, Um, uh, to meet our our standards and get that A, right? Um, But... There, you might be on a team with other people who, you know, I just want to pass, right? I want to get that grade and, and get graduated. That's totally fine, totally understandable. However, that's going to create a little bit of tension, right? When you're working a ton of extra hours and you don't see that same level of investment uh, from your teammates, right? And likewise, if you want to invest a reasonable amount of time in the project, but you've got one or two members of your team who want to go crazy, that's going to be frustrating for you. Okay, um, that by the way, that, that won't get you into any tr- trouble with the, um, the imbalanced team investment. That only happens if you're not investing, like you're investing very little time. Um, but uh, you want to make sure objectives are aligned. So here's what I recommend, okay? All of this, this big tangent I've taken you on, all of this is for your Project 3 prep, okay? Your team makes a big difference on how Project 3 is going to go for you, right? And part of any objective or project is to manage your roster, whether you can control it, like you own the company, right? Uh, Or whether you can partially control it through helping recruit people or partially control it by choosing which team you jump onto. Um, And so you have about 10 days until project three. And here's what I recommend, right? Ask around, ask people you might want to work with, ask them, hey, like, what are your plans for the future? Do you want to go into the game industry? That tells you about some you know, their level of investment. You know, do you not want to? You're just enjoying this as a hobby? That's awesome. Uh, but, you know, you want to make sure you're matched up uh, with people with similar objectives and goals and motivations, okay? Um, also, do other things too. Ask for their project one. Go find it on the Discord Project Progress. It's right there. Go play it. See if it's great. Um, go, uh, go ask their partner, right? There's a little video here I just posted that shows off who everyone's partner is. Sorry, you can't hide that. Uh, ask them how it went, right? Uh, don't be afraid to do a little bit of research. It's important stuff. Um, and if you're a little bit worried about what you know, a little bit of research might reveal, then you need to keep that in mind, okay? And make sure that you're always presenting yourself well, always putting in the effort. Remember, from last lecture, you are always interviewing, okay? This isn't high school anymore. What you do now, you might be judged on, okay? Um, so please uh, always put be in that be in that habit of putting in a, a good effort, an honest effort on everything. Okay. Um, okay. Let's keep going. When you dis- oh here's something that I noticed in the uh, P1 feedback. Okay. Uh, sorry, the P- P1 um, postmortems. So a lot of tension and a lot of conflict and lost time on your team uh, project 
your P1, was about designing APIs that confused teammates or didn't work in the way they expect, right? So the typical pattern is this. Hey, you're going to go build this thing. I'm going to build this thing. And then later, you're going to have to use my thing. I'm going to have to use your thing in some way, okay? When you're designing your API, when you're designing any system, one of the most important things you have to think about is how does someone use this and how could they misuse this? Because they will, right? You need to design your systems to defend themselves uh, against misuse. What does this mean? Well, if you design a function that is supposed to be called by other systems, what you should do is you should run a few checks, right? So when someone calls that function, you know, if, if this function only makes sense, if it only works, if you're in the gameplay scene and totally breaks if you're in the title scene, then your function should run a check. It should run a check to make sure, hey, am I in the gameplay scene? If I'm not, I'm going to do a debug.log error to tell my partner about this assumption. Okay, hey, I, I, hey, I can only be used in this scene. Please change scene or don't call me yet, right? That is defensive programming that makes sure your system is going to work or your partner will eventually get it, be able to get it to work um, without you having to intervene and have a back and forth and chase a bug. Okay, so make sure you defensively engineer your systems because you are on a team and it needs to, to be defended from your, your teammates, as ironic as that sounds. Um, also, keep your inputs as simple as possible so that it's less likely that your, um, your function will be misused, okay, or your system or whatever it is. Okay, P1 Postmortem grade's been released. Here's another thing that I want to put into your head, okay, and I want you to think about this going into uh, your Project 3. Um, so in your P1 postmortems, a lot of teams said this. I could have kept my code base less spaghetti. I could have made it scale better if I had just sat down and planned out my entire architecture before coding. Okay? And as, that, as nice as that may sound, and some people can absolutely do that, geniuses, um, it's often not practical. This is the kind of advice that everyone puts in their postmortem and almost no one practices. Um, and part of it is this, it is very hard to design your architecture from the very beginning of a project because you don't necessarily understand or fully appreciate what every part of your project, every individual system needs to do and what it's going to be responsible for and what issues and conflicts between systems can arise. So what is often a much more fruitful approach is you don't plan out your entire project at the beginning without programming. You plan out most of your project at the beginning by programming, as in doing some experiments, okay? So the first enemy in your game, right, you might need 20 enemies in your game. But you know what? During the first, you know, week of a project, create the first one. Right, create the first one and then say, you know what, what part of the scales, what would be nasty about creating enemies if I had to create 19 more? Okay, can I reuse parts of this first enemy? Okay, what can be reused? Okay, the health, health. Okay, every enemy has health. Even the player has health. We're gonna create a health component. Okay, okay, uh, you know. Um, oh, the player can pick up things, but wait a second, enemies can too. So I'm gonna create uh, an inventory, has inventory component. Okay. So now I never have to implement health or uh, inventory for any other uh, enemy, right, going forward. So those two things scale now. Okay, so what's not going to scale? Okay, the movement is not going to scale very well because every enemy has different movement. Okay, uh, well, so that part's going to be hard to, to do no matter what. Okay, but this other part won't be, right? I can adjust this, right? So you tweak that first enemy until it's, it's built using reusable patterns. And you know that it's going to scale to all the other enemies, and then you now have a category of thing in your game that you know will scale well. So you've done enemies. Now go prototype your first item. Now go prototype your first level. Okay, how do all the, these things scale if I need to build out a 10 minute gameplay experience that's really engaging, right? Um, this is a really good way to plan out. This should be what you mean for most people when you say, I'm gonna plan better my next project at the beginning. Um, you know, write some code, do some experiments, find out what scales and what doesn't, uh, and then you move into full production where you're just knocking out all these, these unique things and testing and iterating on them, okay? So that's what I recommend. Don't say to your partner, 
we're, gonna, we're not going to do any coding until we understand the, our entire architecture. Do some coding so that you can understand what you want your architecture to be, okay? Just don't do a massive amount of programming. Um, make sure you do a little bit of prototyping first, okay? Anyway, that's my tangent. Uh, so I don't see any questions yet or comments, uh, so it's gonna gonna keep going. Da, 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 da. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna ignore this. Oh, it's it's parallax. I can't ignore this, can I? Okay, let's take a look. <clears throat> I talked about parallax, I believe, a little while ago. It's a really nice, juicy effect for taking a 2D game, a game that shouldn't have any depth or feeling of 3Dness to it. And making you feel that anyway, all right? It's the it's the effect where you're looking out your car window, and something in the road right next to you is moving by super fast, but the mountains in the distance and clouds don't like the, look like they're moving much at all, right? Um, so this is another example of parallax that was pretty easy to do. Uh, clouds, uh, any game that is set outdoors can have clouds and immediately get this this depth of feel to it. Look at this, right? Um, it is uh, it is it's, I don't know it it just. Suddenly, the game doesn't look nearly as 2D, though this certainly isn't a perfect implementation. Okay, so let's keep going. I like Parallax. Um, fun, I, you know what? I'm going to skip this. We're going to come back to it. Um, what I want to show you is this. This is a very simple game, but a very juicy one. All right? And you'll see why in just a second. Human Tetris. Chat, has anyone seen this? Has anyone seen this? Human Tetris. Let's uh, minimize my screen here. Let's take a look. Okay, so you get it, right? So it's human Tetris. Uh, the player has to stand there and try and contort their body into certain shapes. Uh, before the time limit expires, the wall gets to them and pushes them into the water. A few things that I want you... I want to do a mental experiment here, okay? I want you to look at this, and I want you to imagine that this wall doesn't move, okay? This wall doesn't move at all. It, it just kind of sits there, right? Okay, well, uh, what does the game look like? What happens to the game? Well, players have an infinite amount of time to get through this challenge, okay? So they size it up, they spend a few minutes thinking about different, they, they experiment a little bit and it takes a lot of time. You know, maybe they go get a, some coffee, maybe they call their friends to talk about it, maybe they get bored and decide it's not very fun anyway and not worth trying because there's nothing on the other side, right? So the time pressure, part of the magic of this game is that you're given time to size it up, but you're not given a ton of time, right? You need to go with your first or second try uh, because I think most people could, could figure this game out and get past most challenges if they were given unlimited time. This is an example where some form of resource pressure is applied and thus the decisions are under pressure and we get to watch players make the wrong one, right? And try and take a bad decision and make it work anyway. Uh, uh, which is often very comedic, very fun to watch, and very fun for the player as well. So that element of time pressure is really important. Um, and consider another thing. Watch this right here, right? Okay, I want you to imagine right now, do a mental transformation, take this game, and I want you to imagine that instead of being pushed into the water by this wall, the wall touches the player, detects that it has been impeded, and the game just kind of stops. The wall freezes, and the game just goes, Meh. 
Mer, that's it. You got to walk away now. Go back to the stands, right? Next competitor up. Right? I mean, that would kind of not be very exciting, wouldn't it? Ask yourself this. Remove the falling into the water, be pushed into the humiliating water from this game. And what are you left with? Well, it might still be kind of fun, but it's not nearly as dramatic, right? It's not nearly as embarrassing, you know, in kind of a playful way uh, for the player. And so ask yourself this. Right? The game just feels a lot less juicy when you get rid of the kind of the animation of what happens when you fail, right? Um, it's so visceral, like you're pushed in the water, you clearly did something wrong. Um, and so this is a good example of juice, right? The game loses a lot um, if, if the person, if, you know, if it just ends in a kind of a boring way. Um, also, consider this as well. It's a really, really nice technique. Uh, kind of the mental transformation. If you want to evaluate a, a design element in a game, just take the game, think about it, and then remove that element and see what happens. Simulate it in your head. What happens and does that make the game more interesting? Does it make the game better? Uh, does it make the game faster and more efficient? Uh, it certainly would in this case. Just end the game as soon as it touches them, next competitor up, right? From a business perspective, it'd probably be a lot, maybe a bit better uh, to do that. Not from an experience, though, and certainly not from a juiciness and drama perspective. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, community resources. I'm not sure why these are here. If you're not part of the Michigan statewide game dev server or the Wolverine Soft Discord server, I encourage you to join. Uh, a lot of great uh, uh, people doing great stuff there. A lot of help there, too. Uh, a quick note. Uh, in your P1 postmortems, a lot of students got a little bit, well, not a lot, but a, a couple teams got burned. Uh, by the um, the fact that sometimes editor sometimes game builds work slightly differently than editor builds. For instance, your script execution order, the order in which the start function runs among all the different components you've made. Um, if you don't set that, if you don't force that to be specific in the project settings edit edit project settings script execution order window. Um, that will be randomized. Okay, so that can cause issues that are not present in your editor. Uh, but are present in your build. So please be sure to build your game every couple days so you can test these things and find them before the last 24-hour scramble, okay? Okay, awesome. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you about what, and actually I want to show you in many different ways, the concept of juice, okay? You're probably already familiar with this concept, um, but we have a fantastic uh, video a uh, uh, conference video, kind of going through what juice can do to a game, how transformative it is, right? How it can take the same game design and turn it into something that feels incredible, that is playful, exciting, exhilarating. Um, and, uh, and so let's get into it, okay? And then I want to implement some of these techniques you're going to see in this video, okay? We're going to take a breakout, a very vanilla, boring breakout game. And we're gonna juicify it. We're gonna add fun to it, make it super exciting, okay? Uh, so go ahead and, and we'll watch this video together. Um, Ishwar, would you post this video into the, twi uh, the Twitch chat in case viewers uh, think it's a little bit laggy on the Twitch stream? They can watch it themselves. Can you do that, Ish? Okay, we'll start the video. Tons of cascading action and response for minimal user input. And use is 
typically visual or auditory, but it doesn't really need to be. Emily Shorts mentions on her blog that interactive fiction, which is a text-based game, uh, they can't really do wiggles and squirts much, but they have their own kind of juice, the fun and uh, sort of unexpected responses you get when you try something in the game that you're not supposed to do. Um, and that's pretty much what juice is about. It's about maximum output for minimum input. So why, why juiciness? I, I recently had the pleasure of giving feedback on some student games, and what I noticed was that almost all of them lacked juiciness. And that made me realize how important juiciness actually is to a game. Uh, because in game design, game design is quite hard and it's impossible to give broad statements that are true for everything. But adding juiciness to your game makes your game better 100% of the time, guaranteed. So in order to demo a bunch of small effects that you can add to your game to make your game more juicier, we decided to make a game, uh, which is a breakout clone. And we're going to show you a bunch of very simple juicy effects you can add to your game to make it better. First of all, we're going to add color because uh, it's hard to tell where the good guys and bad guys if everything is brown. So yes, so much better already. And next order of business. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. Tweeting, which is very related to juiciness. Yes. And open switch. So, tweening. Tweening is one of these mysterious words that we tend to throw around without thinking about too much about what it means, at least Petri and I do. Another word for it is this, this easing as well. And basically, the word tween comes from in betweening. So, when you're doing animation, you want to draw a walk cycle. Maybe you draw this pose, and you draw the next one, and you draw. So, you leave some space in between and you get like the, the keyframes of the animation, the important bits. Then you, in between the animation, you draw in the missing parts. So that's where the word tweening comes from. It's just a lazy way to say in between. Uh, we don't really do keyframes as such when we're doing this type of game programming that we are doing here in this demo. But basically, tweening in the world of computers means that you provide a start point, say one, and you provide an end point, say 11, and you say, I want it to take this long, and use this equation to get there. And you can use this for a bunch of properties. Um, and you can't always use the tweening engine. There are times when it's not appropriate, or you're lazy, or whatever, but you can always use this baby right here. Chat. Okay, chat. Have you seen this code before? Have you seen a piece of code like this? I believe I might have implemented this piece of code uh, when we did the, the target follow, or follow target component. Right? This is a very, 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 very easy way to quickly juice anything, right? Any value, whether that's a vector 3 or a float, anything uh, can be juiced and made to ease, right? As in slowly move to the desired value by using this line right here, okay? Does this make sense to you at all? Yeah? Good. Basically, we're moving x, whatever value that is, 10% of the way we need to go. So at first it will go fast, and then as it approaches its target, it will slow down. Looks very nice, very easy to implement like this, have it run every frame, you're good. Yes, so what he just said, chat, right? This is the value, okay, this is your current value, x. Whatever your current value is, it's x. Okay, target is what you eventually want your x to be. Okay, target minus x, this is the delta that separates your value from what it wants to be. Adding it will make your x become target, okay? However, we don't just add it, that would be pointless. We add that value, but only one-tenth of it, okay? This is the same as taking one-tenth of a step toward the door every step. Chat, if you do this, will you ever reach the door? So you take one tenth, you, every step, you step one tenth of the way to the door. You will never reach the door unless you're in computer programming because rounding errors will make you eventually reach the door, okay? 
Oh, this is called uh, the paradox. Oh, this is, oh, I can't remember. This is a Greek paradox. I can't remember which one, though. Maybe someone in chat can add. Anyway, let's keep going. But we're going to do some, some proper tweening in this game. And a good way, a good place to do tweening is when these blocks appear on the screen. Yes, this is Zeno's paradox. Zeno's paradox. Look it up on Wikipedia. It's pretty awesome. I want to make it look juicy and nice. So we're going to start by tweening their position. As my assistant here will show you. So as he resets the level, they sort of fall in instead. And now we can use these mystical equations here. So instead of using the linear one, which is just falling in. We can use this sort of slow down type equation. Look at it. It's slowing down slightly. We can do better though. We can go slightly past our target using a different equation. Look at that. Very luxurious. And there's also crazy equations. You're laughing. This is serious, serious stuff. And the bouncing equation. This is a crazy one. Look at it. Amazing. And we can also tween other properties that not just position, we can tween rotation, and we can tween scaling. Let's try that. See what happens. Very nice. Yes, that's an excellent point, Foxkilla. Uh, this is an, an example of a, a, an animation curve, or a tween, right, where something, your, 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 your element kind of goes past where it wants to be and then comes back in a bouncy fashion. We literally did this in the Toast uh, systems demonstration, though it was a little bit rushed, and I apologize about that. Nice. You see, it's, it's getting somewhere. And the best thing we can do is add a little bit of delay, a random delay to everything. Looks like this. Look at that. <laughs> Same thing. We're not changing the game at all. So unlike easing and tweening, squeezing and stretching is an actual programming term that you can't Google, but this is, this is a term we came up with for a bunch of different effects you can add to your game that make things way better. Uh, these are, some of these are done with tweening and easing, or most of these are done with tweening and easing. So we're going to start out with making the paddle uh, respond a bit. Stretchy paddle. So instead of... This isn't actually even using any kind of an easing, it's using the offset of the mouse pointer and where the paddle is to figure out a scale of X and Y. Uh, it's a very simple effect to implement. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to add some extra scaling to the ball, so when the ball hits something, it's going to scale up to bigger and then it's going to go smaller with an easing equation. And that looks kind of nice and it adds a bit of feel to the ball hitting things. Then we're going to make the ball rotate. So it's going to rotate in the direction that it's going. We're going to animate this rotation for a very small, subtle effect that's almost impossible to see. Uh, we're going to make also the ball stretch a bit. Uh, this is it's stretching based on its velocity. This looks way better if you have gravity, but it's, it's okay with this. It also looks better if it's actually a ball-shaped thing. Uh, we're going to animate the stretching now, so whenever the ball hits something, it's going to wobble for a bit. And for the last thing, we're going to uh, add color to the ball, so the ball will go white every time it hits something, and then it's going to scale back to its normal. So it already feels way better to move, bounce the ball around. Uh, but this isn't very, this isn't juicy enough, so we're going to make, uh, add some tweening to all of the blocks when something is hit. So when the ball hits something, there's a small scaling effect on all the blocks, which is done with tweening. It's a very simple effect to add. And the last thing, we're going to add bouncy lines. So whenever the ball hits the line, the lines are going to bounce a bit. Adding, ma making things feel so much nicer to play around with. Uh, next up is probably one of the most important parts that you can add. Like, this is the most cost-effective thing you can add to a game to make it more juicier, which is sound. Uh, unfortunately, extremely often ignored part of game development. Uh, this is a simple demo we ripped off from the Steve Swink book, Game Feel. So there are two ball circles that pass through each other, and this is without sound. Uh, we're going to add sound to this, and you can see, hopefully, the difference. So you can see now they seem to bounce off from each other instead of passing through. And this is the same animation with the only exception of adding a sound effect to it. Uh, so now we're going to add some sound effects to our game. Uh, sound effects. 
Yes, remove everything else, yes. enable sound effects. So we're gonna first bounce off the wall, so there's gonna be a small sound when... So much better. Add, add a sound for blocks. Sound effects, thanks to Nicholas. Is he here? Were you here? Yeah. Yay! Oh, come on, give me more than one. You get the point. Uh, add the paddle effect. Yeah! <laughs> and lastly, and very importantly, music by Nicholas. And this, actually, even though the game doesn't have anything else except sound effects, now it feels almost like a real game instead of a crappy demo. Next up, Martin's going to talk about one of his favorite shops, like particles. <laughs> There's this saying, like, you can't, you can't ever have too many particles in your game. And it's, again, you can't make broad sweeping statements, but it's 100% true. Um, let's add some particles. We're going to start with, a, with a, the classic smoke. The ball hits something. We, put a little puff of smoke in there. And you can use whatever particle engine you can find. It's kind of a trap for programmers, these particle engines, because you get stuck making one and you're making it the very best one and then you never use it. Um, but it was fun making, so don't do that. Just find something that's already made, use it. You get particles. Do it, it's like the simplest thing you can program. It's, it's so much fun. Don't listen to him, don't listen to him. So we got smoke in the game, like smoke coming off the ball. We can do better, we can do better. We wanna make something with the blocks. So you want to make them sort of disappear. This isn't technically a particle effect, this is a tween. But if you can manage to hit a block, you can see it's slowly going away. We can do better. We can do better, way better. So let's make them fall away when you hit them. Look at that, it's just falling off the screen. We can do even better, let's add some more stuff. Let's add, like, let's, let's make the ball sort of push the block. Look at that. And why not make it spin while we're at it? And now you can tell like it's hard to see which, like the block falling off is sort of blending with the other one, so let's make it darker. These all simple, simple things like stacking together to make something beautiful. And this next one is not simple, but it's awesome. It's this shatter effect. Look at this. And we put slow motion in the game just to show this. <laughs> so look at it now, it's shattering. Yeah, right where it is. Very complicated and no one can tell. Um, again, with the trap for the programmers. So let's add some more particles for the crashing. You can look at that. Yes. It's just beautiful. Let's go for the paddle particles as well. See if you can hit the paddle. Yay! <laughs> Confetti always works. And there's also this ball trail that we put in the game which is nice, that we just keep track of where the ball has been and we draw a line into this position and it looks very fancy. And now we're going to move on to um, one of the more powerful effects and I want you to be careful with this when you try it at home because it's, um, it's powerful. So, would you bring out the screen shake, Petri? Yes. And this really, really, for effort, this is one of the best ones. So, when the ball hits something, we shake everything. And the ball went from being like a stupid tennis ball to a motherfucking comet or something. <laughs> and if you crank it up a little bit more, Petri, we can get them, like now it's in freight train mode. Like it might very well just break the screen edge and just keep going. Very, very powerful effect. And with great power comes great personality, Petri. So, so this last one is a classic Kyle Gabler trick of making your game juicier. It's not exactly a fact, but it's, it's a thing. Uh, you add eyes to anything you have. Okay. So we're adding some small eyes to the paddle, which is like so little programming effort and art effort. Like the animation is just disabling the eyes for a while and it looks like it's blinking. Uh, we can animate the eyes a little bit more, so we're gonna make it look towards the ball as it's going. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice little thing. Um, we, we, can, uh, we also can add a smile to it. So it's got a small mouth there. 
and it smiles when it hits something. <laughs> That's just scaling the Y value of it. Uh, if you can get the ball to go further away, you can see it's it frowns in horror. <laughs> And for the effort of this, like how much personality it adds, it's insane. Uh, you can also make the eyes a bit bigger. It adds <laughs> so much better with bigger eyes. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty much all the separate categories we have for effects. So for the for the last thing, we're going to disable everything and show you the beginning state of this game. Uh, so it's a breakout clone. Tons of fun. <laughs> uh, now we're gonna enable all the effects. Hopefully. Are you ready? <laughs> Okay, team, right? You saw it. You know, the power of juice and all these juicy elements coming together, right? From trail renders to wobbliness, right? Uh, to sprunginess, uh, to the screen shake that you saw, uh, to the particles that you saw, to the audio that you heard, all of this comes together to transform what really is a very simple and played out game design uh, into something that is suddenly injected with life and energy. And you want to play it just to kind of see what other effects and magic will happen. And so we want to start getting some of that into our games, into our project two. We'll get a little bit of that in. Um, it will be a criterion on your P2 gold. Um, and then on, definitely on project three, right? If you watch some of the trailers on the east494.com and you remember the trailers from earlier in the course that we showed you, um, juice is a very big part of your final student projects, okay? Uh, and a, a very good thing to show off to recruiters, to show off to friends, family as well, because they really come through even in a, a trailer. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to take our, our five-minute break a little bit early, uh, and then what we'll do is we'll come back, and with the time we have today, hopefully we'll get through a couple things. Uh, we will get through uh, Trail Render, which is very, very easy and simple. Uh, we will get through Hook's Law, which is a way to give your objects a really organic and natural springiness uh, by using an equation, Hooke's Law, that models how real springs work uh, in real life. Um, and then hopefully we will also get to screen shake and then we'll probably save the particle system uh, for Monday. It's a little bit more complicated, a little bit hairier, uh, but we'll see. Maybe we'll have enough time to get into it, okay? So I'm going to throw the music on. Uh, and we are going to be back uh, in about five minutes, okay? Maybe a little bit longer than that. Okay, let me get this going. You can ask questions. Ish and I will try and, uh, and uh, uh, answer them for you. Let me get this music going, then I'm going to peace out for just a moment. Uh, let's get some music. There's our music going. There we go. A popular request, we finally got Halo, some Halo music in today. We also got some Pac-Man World boss music and some, uh, uh, some Guitar Man music in as well this morning. So I hope you enjoyed. Uh, let me know if you can figure out what uh, this music is from. I think by the second track in about four minutes, uh, you will know. Uh, at least some of you will. Okay, let's go.
Okay, so those first two tracks you heard uh, were the tracks from the Chicken Run uh, PlayStation 1 game. Uh, and this last one is from Super Mario Galaxy 2. Well, in this... Ali, Ali, come here. Come here. Oh, and, and this little baby uh, snuck into my office uh, when... Uh, Ali, say hi. Uh, snuck into my office when I was away, so... Mm. Oh, such a good girl. Ten years old and still full of energy in life. It's just incredible. Uh, so uh, maybe she will help me out with a lecture sometime. I will need to let her out, though. Okay, come on, Ellie. Sorry. We gotta go, baby. Oh, come on, Ellie. Ellie. Good girl. Good girl. Oh, you don't want to go? You don't want it? Ellie, come on. Come on. Ellie. Okay, good girl. Good girl. It's not your fault. It's not your fault, baby. All right. We'll go for a walk later. <sighs> okay. Let's see here. Okay, let's get to it because we, we got some stuff to do. Uh, juice is a huge topic. Um, so I want to show you a few more instances, not from that video, but from other ones. Who's watched South Park? Does anyone like South Park? Um, it is a show that is extremely minimalist uh, and extremely uh, efficient to produce. Okay? They have to make each episode in six days, which is extremely hard, and yet it still needs to be juicy. It still needs to be good and fun to look at. Uh, and so they do a really cool thing with this, with their, their art style, uh, with how characters move around. Um, so let me get it going here. Okay. So go ahead and go. Watch how they walk. Watch Where's how the these characters we walk. We cab here! Damn it, mine's in the shop! Hey, help, stop! Please, it's an emergency! <laughs> Come on! Nelson! Nelson, I need to come over and use your computer! No, I, I need to play World of Warcraft! Nelson! Okay, so did you see how they were walking, right? So they were walking, and you can imagine in a really cheap version of this episode, it's just the characters sliding. But the animators need to get across the impression that these characters are walking, so what they do is they bounce the characters. The it's the Damn same it, sprite. The Their legs hey, don't move at all. Stop. Right? Their legs don't move at all, but they still get this intent across, uh, which makes it effective. Uh, despite the fact that it's extremely cheap and it is um, uh, 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 very effective. Right? Okay, so I want to show you that we actually use this. You can use this very easily in your games. Okay? Um, it is, in fact, uh, the mathf.absolute value of the mathf.sign function over time dot time, okay? If you put this into your game and then, you know, say, oh, okay, uh, transform dot uh, position uh, equals vector three dot up times this. If you put code like this into your game, what'll happen is you'll see that your object goes boink, 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 and you can make it faster and you can make the arc larger by multiplying inside of this, uh, multiplying time to, uh, time to time, or multiplying the final vector, right? Uh, to do um, the frequency, adjust the frequency of that wave or the amplitude. Um, this is extremely effective and you can tie it to anything. It doesn't need to just be vertical movement up and down. It can also be rotation as well, uh, as you'll see in this little example. Um, a little while ago, uh, we started working on kind of an RTS system uh, for our Arbor Interactive games. And so we created this, right? Uh, this is just a single sprite character. It's an art student. Uh, and when you click someplace, she will start to move. The game, uh, she has a component that will grab the sprite render and her transform and will ask, have I moved this frame? How fast have I moved this frame? And if your character is moving that frame, what it will do is it will make sure it's looking in the right direction using the Paper Mario fade. Right, this just by just taking the x scale, and and uh, lerping it from negative one to one or one to negative one, and it will take your character and just put it on that absolute value of the sine wave to make it look like it's walking. Right, the shadow does the rest for making you feel like this character's in a place. One thing that's really cool is that this is ultra cheap, and once you've implemented it once, as long as you implemented it in kind of a flexible way, you can use it on enemies of any size and shape. Uh, so here's an example of that. Let me uh, get this video down here. Hold on. <clears throat> hold on. Hold on. Here we go. 
So uh, here we go. We've got a little character, but we also have our uh, big squirrel boss over here. You don't want to run in. Don't want to. Don't want to. Don't want to fight him. That's a one-hit KO right there, right? And you can even see some items down there that are bouncing around, trying to get your attention to go collect them. So anyway, a very, very reusable thing, very easy to implement uh, once you know about it. Um, so consider using it if you have moving characters and want a really cheap animation. If you want a cheap animation that is effective and does not use the animator at all, consider it, okay? Um, juiciness, by way of timing camera movements to music, okay? If you have audio in your game, and you should, one of the most effective ways to give your game a polished, professional, well-paced, and well-timed, put-together feel is to make things happen to some sort of beat or moment in the music, okay? I want you to watch this clip. Uh, however, I'm going to do something to it. I'm going to get rid of the audio. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Kill it, kill it. Good. All right, watch this clip. Looks kind of neat, doesn't it? This is the F-Zero racing game. Yeah, it's a cool looking course, right? But that's a, essentially that's all you get. The visuals show you it's a cool looking course. The camera pans are kind of neat, but that's kind of it. Yeah, it's, it's all right. Um, however, let's turn on the music. And I want you to feel the energy, okay? Chat, chat, what did you notice? Did you feel it? Did you feel it, chat? What did you notice? The game did something very particular timed to the beat of that opening kind of intro tune. Absolutely correct, Gaming Bookworm. They changed the camera pan. The camera pan's already impressive. They change to the next one at the beat, at the moment, right? Uh, so we'll play, it's very short, so we'll play it one more time. Just feel the incredible energy, uh, and, and it, just, it, just, it just feels so art artistic. It feels designed, right? Like someone had incredible intent to show you the track in just this way, to get you hyped for this incredible race. Incredible game, too, by the way. And always, as the intro tune kind of fades out, bah, 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 as it fades out, it always shows you the, the starting line where then when you transition to gameplay, where you are at, right? So it's, uh, it's just so incredibly put together. Okay, uh, so I think that's just about all I want to show you. What I want to do is I want to get into a few topics. How do you implement stuff like that? Okay. All right, let's go set up a test scene here. So I'm going to go at my, uh, and, and by the way, I'm sorry if this goes a little bit slowly. I'm a little bit sick right now. And so it's a, it's a little bit, a little bit hard to think about what I want to do ahead of time. But anyway, let's go ahead and get some stuff going here. We got our little ball here and there we go. Uh, and let's go ahead and uh, this doesn't look so, the skybox is nasty. So we're going to get rid of that skybox. Bye-bye. We're going to have a nice, classy, a dark, uh, we're going to go ahead and create a material here. We're going to create a folder for our materials. We're going to go ahead and create a material. What color are we thinking about? Well, it needs to be something that isn't too dark. So let's go ahead and, um, otherwise it's going to disappear. Let's go ahead and get a nice, like, let's get a light, nice light blue going on. And this is going to be an unlit uh, light blue. So it just it just uh, shines. How about we do something like that? Um, and let's get, um, can we get a color going? Let's go... Uh, not transparent. Let's just go. Let's just go color for now. Gonna get a light blue going. How about that? That looks. Uh, oh, that. Oh, that looks pretty nice. It's not just pure white. Um, so what we'll do is we're gonna go ahead. We'll drag this material on. See how this looks. Does it look good? Ooh, I kind of like it. I don't know though. I don't know though. Shadow might be important uh, for this this time. So let's bring it close to the camera. Let's bring our camera down to zero. See how that looks. That's not bad. Um, what I would like to do, though, is I would like to have us uh, have a little bit of shadow going on. So let's uh, let's go to the let's go to the well, what do we want? Where's the standard? Let's go to opaque. Yeah, it doesn't look all that great. Can we add emissiveness so that it uh, 
A mission. I, I, don't, I don't think this is going to show up unless we have bloom. Yeah. Oh, ooh, ooh. Oh, that doesn't look great. Yeah, I don't like it. Yeah, it doesn't look great. Can we turn tame this? Can we turn this down real time? Can we? No, let's get rid of that. What do we want to do? Hey, well, let's bring in a let's bring in a light. Let's bring in another light. We're gonna bring in another light, and we're gonna actually change its orientation so this looks a little bit better. Go ahead and uh, do do. Whoop. Yep, there you go. All right, that looks a little bit better. It's a little bit ominous, right? This is the dark and edgy sequel to Rollerball. We play the game. It looks okay. Whatever, I'm not super happy. Maybe we'll update it later. Um, let's go ahead and uh, add one more light because I don't like that dark corner on the side. It's way too edgy. Let's go over here. Let's um, make it go like this. Maybe like this. There we go. Okay. That looks kind of funky too. It looks like we're looking at a Dragon Ball or something, except it's blue. Okay, uh, so what I want to do is I want this ball to fall and when it hits the ground i want it to feel like a nice impact right some some punch to the collision between the ball and the ground okay um but first you know i want this to be a bouncy cartoony juicy ball so when it hits the ground i want it to morph and i want it to bounce and wiggle a little bit okay so all this is kind of complicated let's break it down i just want the ball to wiggle in fact i want to wiggle when i press the space bar that's a pretty good start yeah um so what i want to do <clears throat> is I'm going to do this. I'm going to call this, I'm going to create a new component. I'm going to call this has hooks, uh, has hooks effect. Okay. Is that, is that how you spell hooks name? I don't want to mess this up. Bingo. That is, that is in fact how you spell his name. So it has hooks effect. Uh, we're going to go ahead and create that component. We're going to wait for the, the, um, Visual Studio to start up. Yeah, spheres are pretty good at telling you where your sources are, your light sources. Later on, we'll teach you about post-processing, which is the idea that we take the final render shot in our game and we do something with it. We add film grain, we take the lighting and we blur it uh, to create, um, or bleed it uh, to create bloom effect. Uh, Oblivion and the Elder Scrolls game make crazy use of the bloom effect. It makes everything look fantastical, though not necessarily fantastic um, if you overuse it. Um, it, it, is, it is sometimes said it's like kind of putting Vaseline over your, your game camera. Anyway, okay, we got this going on. Okay, we got Hook's Law. And void do hook, uh, let's, call this, um, uh, let's call this perturb. We're going to do that later. Okay, so... Hooke's Law, does anyone know what Hooke's Law is? It is for modeling springs, okay? And never be afraid, right? When you want to learn about something, just Google it. You've got Wikipedia. Wikipedia is kind of much better as a professional reference than for an educational reference. Uh, these articles tend to be so dense, uh, they can send your mind spitting right away. Fortunately for us, this Hooke's Law article has the most important equation uh, for us right here at the beginning. Fs, so the force of the spring, equals kx. Uh, in physics, I was always very confused because I, I would see these big equations and I just couldn't remember what all the, the letters meant. Okay, in this case, right, you've got force, f, you've got k, which is literally just a number. It's just a modifier. You tweak it, it is a stiffness constant that kind of gives your spring a stiffness to it. So is it going to come back, or is it going to, right? Um, and so that's, we're just going to have to experiment with K until we find a spring behavior we like. X is interesting. It is actually the displacement from your spring's normal resting state value. Okay. So um, what happens is this force, if X is zero, which means your displacement, your spring is displaced, like not at all. It's at a resting state. That means there's no force, right? However, if you take your spring and you pull it apart, that X gets bigger, which means you got a bigger force trying to pull it back to its resting state, okay? So here, that's what we're gonna do. Um, we need this force because there's another equation that's important. You wanna see it? It is F equals MA from physics. You took physics 140, yeah? Um, so F equals MA, okay? And this is really good because we can use F equals MA 
Uh, and we can use uh, the equation right there, f equals kx. I'll do it on my notepad right here, right? You put those two equations together, f equals kx, and you've got f equals ma, which means you have ma equals kx, which means we can say uh, acceleration uh, is equal to kx divided by m, okay? So there you go. There's your, uh, there's your physics 140 lecture for the day. Um, and that's a really simple equation. One of the cool things here, however, is that everything in our, our experiment today is going to have a mass of 1, right? You divide anything by 1, it doesn't mean much, right? So we're going to get rid of that m, and we simply have a equals kx. There you go. Uh, so we're going to have k, uh, a equals kx. So let's go ahead and punch that into the, uh, the thing here, right? Let's get this going. So <coughs> we got uh, float uh, k. That's going to be equal to, I don't really know. So let's make it a public variable. Um, let's zoom in so you can see here. Uh, public k equals, and I'm just going to guess here, if I recall from previous lectures, it's going to be really good at like 0.35 or something. Um, by the way, I got a new lamp here so you can see, see us a little bit better. Um, so we got k uh, equals uh, 0.35 or whatever it's going to be. Uh, we then have x. Okay, what is the difference uh, between, you know, what we want and where we are. Um, if we think about our scale, because that's the thing we want to bounce, right? Moing, moing, moing. Um, we actually want this displacement to be uh, vector 3, probably, right? Yeah, yeah, I think we do. So let's go ahead and do this. Um, uh, do we want it? You know what? Let's just keep it at x, right? Because we can multiply by vectors to transform it. All the dimensions and axes are going to be the same. So let's do this. Float x, our displacement, is going to be uh, our where we want to be, right? So vector 3, so it's going, to be, it's going to be 1. We want our x value to be 1, our scale to be 1, uh, minus what our current scale is of this object. So we're going to go transform that local scale uh, dot x, okay? So there we go. We got our x. Um, we also have um, our acceleration. What does our acceleration need to be? So float a is going to be equal to k uh, times x. Uh, I think there might be a negative sign in there. We'll find out pretty quickly if it's incorrect at the end. Um, and then, okay, we've got our acceleration, right? Well, what do we need to do with it? Acceleration should is the derivative of a velocity, and velocity is how much we change our scale every frame. Uh, so let's do this. Uh, vector, uh, uh, let's do float. Float velocity is equal to 0, 0.0, okay? Now, acceleration is the change in uh, velocity, so we're going to use this to change our velocity here. There you go. We got that going on. Um, we don't want our spring to go on forever, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to actually apply a, uh, a bit of friction to it. We'll call this a friction flat, uh, factor or a dampening factor. I'm just going to... Just gonna, yeah, I'm just going to call this the friction factor. Let's go for it. Uh, friction, oh. and let's call this like 0.98f, okay? So every single frame, we're going to lose 2% of our velocity no matter what happens. Uh, in other words, we're going we're gonna to do this. Times equals this. So multiply it by 0 0.98, and you've got, your, um, you've got your, your loss here, okay? Anyway... Uh, so we've got x being calculated. That's affecting what a is. A is affecting what velocity is. Velocity doesn't mean much if it's not actually changing our scale. We add a tie velocity in a scale now. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Transform that local scale. <coughs> this is a vector 3, so we need to add or subtract a vector 3. Uh, velocity is currently a float. So that's fine, though. We'll turn it into a vector 3 by just doing this. Vector 3.1. <coughs> And, uh, you know, there you go. Uh, hopefully this uh, gets us going. But remember, you always iterate. You write a little bit of code, and then you see what happens. Okay, so we're going to do that right now. I think I might need a negative here in this equation, actually. Uh, let's, let's find out what happens. By the way, nothing's going to happen because our, our object is, is currently, it's going to start with the scale that it wants. So x is going to be 0, which means a will be 0, which means velocity will stay 0, which means we don't change our scale. Uh, so perturb, what this is going to do is this is going to take our object and it's going to just take our transform and it's going to say, hey, local scale is equal to 0 0.5. Um, 
And let's go ahead and uh, make it tiny, multiply it by a vector. Is there some shenanigans, chat? Is there some, some shenanigans going on in chat? All right, well, that's okay. We've got the uh, Ishwar and, and uh, Amber are on the guard. We'll be fine. Um, okay, so every frame we want to check and do our little cheat if input dot get key down key code dot space another bot that's a shame um, and uh, we'll click perturb okay and hopefully that'll change our transform now here's the thing you remember in physics in in your calculus homework where uh, you know you either got the right answer or it was the negative of that answer so that was the first thing you checked on your online homework that's what we're gonna do okay so let's press spacebar. Oh, all right. Hey, first try, huh? That doesn't happen often. Interesting. Um, so let's uh, let's go ahead. And what I want to do is this doesn't look all that great. Uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to make this less stiff. Let's try uh, let's try something a little bit lower. Ooh, yeah, that's, a, that's kind of interesting. Let's try something really low. See what see what happens. Ooh, look at that. That's a soft bounce right there. Um, uh, uh, let's reduce this a little bit so it'll last a little bit less long. Let's make it a little bit more stiff. Um, and we're just going to iterate like this. This is so much fun. Oh my gosh. Let's do that. Okay, we got this boing. That is very nice. Um, so we're going to save these values because I really like that effect. And we're going to quit the game. We lose our values, but because I saved them, I can just copy paste them back in. I'm also going to do another thing. I don't want us to shrink down that much because it's a little bit too powerful. Our bounce is too big. Um, so we're going to just go by half instead and see how that looks instead. <clears throat> oh, am I blocking? Am I blocking your... Uh... Hold on. I'm not sure really where to put myself here. Uh-oh. Um, maybe I'll put myself in the in the project pane so you can see the in inspector. Okay. Oh, look at that. Would you look at that? Okay. So imagine this is like a UI button. You click the button on the UI and it it bounces like that. Like it can. There was a force coming out of your mouse pressing it down, um, like a lily pad even or a balloon or something. It's just it feels incredible. Um, so. Anyway, this is a really good start. Now what I want um, is I want this to happen when I, I'm on the ground, okay? So we'll take this sphere and uh, I'm gonna give it a rigid body so it will fall. We also need to give it some sort of uh, platform underneath it. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, create a cube and we'll center this. We'll lower it a little bit. Ooh, this is too close. So let's go ahead and, and move it. Um, gonna hold control to snap it nice and, and organized. Um, we'll bring it down, you know, we'll bring it down. Two is fine. We'll make it uh, wider. So, you know, three is fine. Okay. Uh, so let's, uh, yeah, that's a fine view, you know, it'll work. Uh, okay, so uh, it's gonna fall to the ground. And when it falls to the ground, what we want to do is we want to do that bounce, okay? But we're gonna have a problem, okay? We're gonna have a problem, chat. Can you guess what the problem is going to be? when I press spacebar to test it. Look at this, do you see that? Are you seeing this chat? Okay, the problem is that whenever we do that bounce effect, it doesn't just change how our object looks. It changes the scale of our entire object, which means that the collisions and the collider on our object is changing in scale too, right? That green sphere you see that's getting smaller, which means the ball falls, and then when it gets larger, it's on the ground, so it pushes up and, and the ball like hops, right? You see this? The ball hops. You should not be doing that, okay? If this were a platforming game and the ball was your character, this would be a disaster because you might do the bounce effect on your player so it looks nice. However, if your player tries to jump when they're off the ground, they're not going to jump. The game's going to eat their input, and they might get knocked out for that uh, because of the game's fault, right? The game ate their input. The controls suddenly feel terrible. It's just nasty. So um, what we need to do is somehow we need to account for the fact that we only want to change the visuals of this object. We don't want to change the physics, okay? In fact, we don't want to change any game logic at all. 
We don't want to change any game object at all. Game, we just want to change how it is shown. Okay? Has anyone, chat, has anyone heard of the model view controller, the MVC design pattern or approach in programming? Have any of you heard of this? It's very popular in web frameworks. Um, it's popular in other contexts too, okay? It's the idea that you have a, a model, so you have a piece of data, right, a bunch of data. You have a view of that data that's only job is to show the data off, okay? It doesn't affect the data, it doesn't alter the data. It just shows it in some way, in some weird ways sometimes, in some other, you know, very close to the data ways. Um, and then a controller that can alter the data. So our objective here is we want to have the model, the game object, right? The game logic, how the player actually is. And then we want to have the view of the player. Okay, this is what the player sees. This is the, the view of the avatar, how we render, how we show the player. But it doesn't have anything to do with the game's logic. It doesn't have collisions. It doesn't affect how the game runs under the hood. Um, it just allows us a lot of freedom to change how the game looks and how an object looks. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the sphere. We're going to remove its rigid body because that you know that's affects the game logic and how the game proceeds. It, it affects the mechanics. We're going to remove the sphere. Actually, we're, uh, we'll make a copy of it first, okay? So we don't lose a bunch of work. You know, what? let's make a copy. We're going to rename these things, okay? This uh, this object right here is gonna be our actual game object. So we're gonna call this the, uh, we're gonna call this the sphere. Oh, oh, gonna call this the sphere. And then we're gonna call this other one the sphere view, okay? And um, what we'll do is, you see we got two different things here, right? But the sphere is gonna be unique, okay? It's gonna keep all the gameplay mechanic related stuff. It's gonna keep the collisions, so it's gonna keep the collider component. It's gonna keep the rigid body, but you know what? The hook's law, that bouncy effect, doesn't affect gameplay. We're gonna get rid of it. And by the way, the mesh render doesn't affect gameplay. We're gonna get rid of it, okay? So now we have an invisible object that represents the true state of the sphere. And then we have this sphere view, which needs the mesh render because its whole goal, its whole purpose is to show the underlying data. Um, and we're going to get rid of the sphere collider because that affects the gameplay and the view is not allowed to affect gameplay. We're going to get rid of the rigid body. That affects gameplay. We're going to keep all the visual related components. So we got our sphere, which represents the true gameplay. And we got our sphere view, which just is our way of showing the gameplay to the player. We're going to take this uh, sphere view and we're going to give it a follow target component, which you've probably created a few times. We've certainly made it a few times in this course. Uh, and we'll write that up really quickly. I probably could have grabbed it from another project, but <clears throat> whatever. We're gonna do follow target. Uh, let's do this. Uh, public uh, transform target. We're gonna have a public float ease factor, uh, and this is gonna be 0 0.2. So it will slowly kind of it will lurk every every frame. It will go 20% of the way to where it wants to be, to where its target is. Uh, and then every single frame, uh, probably, uh, nah, 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 we want, yeah, let's do late update. Uh, instead of update, that means it'll run this update last. It, the last thing it does, it, uh, in the last script that runs in the game will be this follow target script. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll say, you know what, let's go transform that position. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to use that equation from the, uh, the, the lecture. Though you know what, actually this is going to be more intuitive though. Let's do this. We're gonna do. We're gonna use the lerping function, uh, and we're gonna go. Hey, transform dot position. We want to go uh, from our transform dot position to the target stop position, and we want to go only twenty percent of the way there. Okay. So every frame we go twenty percent of the way from our current position to our target position, and that's uh, you know that's essentially it. Oh, we're gonna use this fun uh, this uh, variable though. Otherwise, it's useless. Okay, cool. So uh, let's see if this works. Uh, we will need to hook it up first. <clears throat> yeah. 
Okay, so what we'll do uh, is we will drag in this sphere so that our view knows what it should follow. And then when the game starts, let's go ahead and drag our actual game object way up here. Uh, when the game starts, we'll see this. Oh, okay. It works, right? It works. It looks okay. It's a little bit weird because you can we can see our view over here quickly run to where the ball is. You sometimes see this in an online multiplayer game where the game doesn't actually know where the other player is because a network packet hasn't arrived in a while. There's some lag. Um, and then suddenly it gets a packet telling where a, a player is and you'll see their player not warp, but you'll see that it lerp. So it'll look like it's zooming across the map, right? Uh, this is what they're doing. They've separated the player's actual location from the view that shows us where their location is. Um, anyway, so let's take a look at this again. <clears throat> hey, looks great, right? So now I want you to look at something. This is the main point, okay? Look at this. Look at this. We can now have our view do that beautiful Hooke's Law sprunginess. Uh, without actually impacting any of the gameplay. The ball doesn't jump. The physics aren't changing. Uh, our actual sphere is literally just kind of sitting there and hanging out, right? Our, our, our view can do anything. Our sphere is just going to sit there, though, right, and, and be at the center where it's supposed to be. Um, and there we go. It's working uh, basically like we want. Um, so uh, what I want to do now is I want to add a little bit. Actually, I want to create a convenience component because there may be a future in which we want to create a bunch of these balls. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to create this sphere as a prefab. Let's go ahead and create a, a folder. Uh, <coughs> let's call it the prefab. And we got a sphere going here. Um, and uh, we're also want, going to want to create a, a sphere view as well. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what's hard is that if we spawn a sphere, we don't necessarily, you know, we don't necessarily have a, a prefab. You know, we don't have a view. This sphere is here, but it has no view to represent it, so the player can't see it. So that's not good. So what we need to do is we need to make our, our sphere prefab, we need to program it more defensively. Remember the beginning of lecture? It should be this easy. If any member of our team drags a sphere out into the world and plays the game, uh, it should automatically create its own view to represent it. So here's what we're going to do. Now that's, that just makes it really easy to use. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a new component. It's going to be called spawn view on start. <coughs> cool. Um, so uh, let's go ahead. And uh, that's not the right component we want to add. Spawn view on start. This component, its entire purpose is going to be to spawn the view for that object. So it needs to know what object it needs to spawn, what view it needs to spawn. So we're going to call this a view prefab. Uh, and then, uh, well, when the game starts, it's going to do this. It's going to do game object instantiate. What does it want to instantiate? Oh, come on, autocomplete. What does it want to instantiate? Well, the view prefab, right? Um, where does it want to instantiate it? Well, uh, how about where we are, right? Uh, so it's it's immediately representing us well. Uh, we don't really care about rotation. I think that's probably fine. Yeah, I think it wants the rotation. Quaternity identity. Actually, you know what? Give it the rotation we have. How about that? Um, transform rotation. There we go. And uh, that's pretty much it. However, if we do this, the, the view that we spawn in is not going to follow us, right? So we create a view object, but we haven't told that view object that, you know, who, who they should follow. So what we'll, we'll do is this, view prefab that get component, follow target, uh, and we will say, let's uh, do, let's do this. We got to set the uh, trade, we got to set the target, got to set the target value. Um, and it's going to be us, right? And there you go. That's pretty much it. Um, you could do something like, hey, if you want to be really defensive, if we were programming on a team, we might want to do this. Um, so let's do uh, view prefab. Uh, if view pre prefab dot get component follow target uh, is not equal uh, is is equal to null, then we're going to send a warning message and we're, we're going to bail. We're going to say debug.log error, um, you know, uh, view prefab requires a follow target component to represent its uh, model game object. Okay, there you go. 
and then we'll return because we don't want to we don't want to execute this code or we'll get a null null reference error there. Okay, so that is a nice little bit of defensive programming. We got a question in the chat. Um, would it would it be good practice to hold both a model and, and view of an object under an empty parent object? This way, we could just have a prefab called sphere, which holds both the model and view as children, rather than needing to give every model we create the spawn view component. Um, that's a way you could do it. Um, I tend to not really like that uh, approach because I get nervous about what could happen to the parent object. Um, in the event that that parent object gets deleted or destroyed, it will destroy both children. So you're losing the um, sphere, uh, you're losing the sphere view. You also have to be careful about what happens if your sphere gets destroyed. So if your sphere gets destroyed, you have to take care of the view, right? Um, but you also have to take care of the parent game object. You have to make sure to remember to delete that. Um, otherwise, you are going to have a bunch of parent game object containers that are empty building up in your, your hierarchy. That actually reminds me, though, we should probably do something where every frame our view checks. Uh, you know, uh, how about public bool should destroy self if target is null. And we'll set this to equal to true since it seems like a sensible thing to do. Every single frame will check to make sure our target uh, is not equal to null. Um, okay, if it is equal to null, we're going to go ahead and destroy ourselves. If target is null and this boolean is set, then we're going to destroy ourselves. And then we're going to going to bail and stop executing logic. Okay, so that's actually a bit of de defensive programming there. Um, also, I'm I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of just terrified of parenting stuff uh, because if you okay so why is this a separate object instead of parenting? So parenting is a really really it's a it's a it's it's kind of like a oh what's what's something that looks appealing but then starts to make your your world a nightmare? So parenting uh, is really nasty in a few ways uh, in that you lose control. Uh, when you parent. You lose a lot of control if you parent one object to another. If the parent object rotates, if it moves, if it scales, if it if it sneezes, your child object is going to be affected by that. And you don't always want that. Right? Um, so, you know, we might, uh, for instance, this sphere right now, it actually, it doesn't warp to where the target object is. It, it kind of smoothly follows, which is really nice. Uh, because it just looks very smooth and it's it's pretty pretty awesome. If we parented it, then this would not be possible. the 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 sphere view uh, the view would be inside. It would be parented to the actual sphere object, um, which means that it would always be beholden to where that that kind of source model sphere object is. Uh, we couldn't do any effects on the we if the sphere itself were to grow, uh, then our sphere view would look really nasty and distorted. Um, and if it were to rotate, then our sphere view would look really terrible too, because it would have to rotate uh, with the center of rotation being at that sphere object, which means it would probably go on this wide radius for a while. It's just a, it's just a huge mess. Um, so avoid parenting when you are not in like tutorial one or tutorial two. There, the restrictions are very nice. Um, it, the restrictions are not, not a big deal there for what it gives you. But here, we need to do fancier stuff. We need more power. We need more flexibility. So creating a simple uh, follow target script is a really good idea. OK, um, so uh, let's, uh, let's make sure we don't, uh, we don't break it here. OK, we're going to get rid of our, our sphere. Uh, we're going to get rid of our view prefab. In the sphere, we're going to go ahead and give it our sphere prefab. And uh, there we go. We're going to bring it out here. Here's another thing that's kind of nasty, though. Like, oh great, we can't see anything. Yeah, we can't see anything. This is no good, isn't it? That's boring. How, how are we supposed to design our levels when we can't see our objects? Okay, let's do something like this then. Um, let's bring our mesh renderer back. And we need to give it our material. Where's our material at? So it just doesn't look too terrible. Uh, there it is. Okay, so we've got our, uh, our, our sphere back. And we're going to do another thing. What we'll do is inside of this uh, sphere uh, view has sphere uh, spawn uh, sphere view. What we'll do is 
we will grab our mesh render. So mesh render MR equals get component mesh render. And then we're gonna say if we have a mesh render, well, we're gonna go ahead and you know turn it off. Okay. Okay. Yep, so now we got a little nice organization here. We'll block it a little bit. There we go. Okay, we don't need the update function. We're gonna hold ourselves to a really high standard here. <coughs> okay, um, so what's gonna happen, hopefully, when we try this out, is uh, we're gonna run the game. This sphere is gonna spawn a sphere view to show it off. It's gonna go invisible itself. So we won't see two spheres. That would be uncanny. And uh, you know, there we there we go. I did not see anything. What happened? What happened? It did not spawn a sphere. I don't see any sphere here. What happened? So let's go through here, uh, and it's on the ground, so that works fine. Let's see what happened. We're gonna go game objects and instantiate view prefab. Let's actually call this something so we can better debug it view prefab dot name is equal to uh, view if view prefab dot is, is equal to null and then we're gonna set it there otherwise we set it there so that would be fine set it then oh interesting I wonder if we're destroying it so when this spawns in when it spawns in its target is it not set did we not set the target I think we do yeah that's fine are we destroying ourselves? Let's do this. Debug.log uh, destroy view. Okay. Quick little debugging session so we can practice making it fast. Hmm. Ah. You're using the prefab instead of the return value of game object instantiate. I'm so glad the power of pair programming. Yeah? Okay, so you're right. We're not even capturing this variable. So let's do this. Let's do this uh, new view. Uh, and we'll go ahead and we'll still name it. And we'll, we've got to replace all these references. One of the cool things about Visual Studio is you can actually go in and do the rename. and It'll just replace the reference everywhere, right? This is actually a, uh, a bother, though, because a uh, new view, we, we messed up the uh, thing here. So let's go view prefab. And we'll fix our references up here. Visual Studio put the this in, which is not necessary. Okay, so we got new view. It looks like it's going to be okay. All right, let's do that. Yeah, looks good. All right, so let's test this out. Lots of testing. Going to compile the game. See what happens. Hey, all right, and test it. It still works. Great. Awesome. Good. Okay, and the sphere is not rendering. Uh, so this is a this is a half decent pattern. Uh, uh, there are some other things you can do uh, to uh, to get your visuals working and separated from your game log logic, but this is a pretty straightforward one, pretty easy. Um, so what I want to do is I want to experiment real, a little, real quick. Um, I think we may have shown off the. Uh, uh, did we show off the the trail render before? I'm not sure if we did or not. Let's go ahead and, and really quickly do it. Uh, you can add a trail render component, uh, which will give you that kind of nice juicy feeling of motion. Right, that you saw in the uh, example video, and so when we start we, when we start the game, we get this uh, we get this weird kind of pink line. That is the pink color that tells us we're missing a material. So let's go ahead and find a material. We'll go ahead and, and say, hey, let's let's just use this default render line. It's going to look a lot better. Well, it won't be the obnoxious pink. It'll be just be an obnoxious white now. Um, that's not all that cool. So let's go ahead and make this something a little bit more appropriate. We're going to go find a nice blue. We can click on the color and go to blue. Let's, uh, we want it to start off very blue. How about that? Um, but then we want it to trail off into a nice black uh, as it's kind of trailing into the, the night sky back there. Um, we'll also cause... Uh, actually, no, let's not deal with alpha. I also want to adjust the width. So currently the line stays the same uh, width depending on how far it is behind us in time. So uh, let's go ahead and set our time to be like 0.5 seconds behind us before it ends. And we'll make sure that our width starts as, as uh, wide as we are. But we'll use this graph uh, to go ahead and make it small as the time goes down. 
So let's go ahead and take a look at this. Oh, Woo. wow. All right, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Let's look, take another look real quick. Okay, cool. Um, so one thing that we want to do is we want to get away from this uh, cheat, this cheat code here, where we've got this, uh, we've got this perturb function. And how do we want to do this? How do we want to do this? Mm, okay, I'm going to use something. Uh, okay, what I would like to do, what I would like to do is I would like this to be kind of decoupled. I don't really want has hooks effect to be coupled to anything else. Or anything else to be coupled to hooks effect it would be nice if we could just detect a collision but i don't have the event bus in this code base i'm sorry everyone this would be a good example of you know when two things collide you emit an event that event class contains the two objects that collided and also contains the relative velocity at which they collided and then anything can subscribe to those events and say hey am i the thing that collided if so or is my target the thing that collided? If so, I want to do a bounce, right? Unfortunately, the event bus isn't here, so we're probably going to have to go with the observer instead of pub sub. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do um, is I would like to um, I would like to go ahead and we're gonna just we're just gonna kind of hack it up, um, and we're gonna say. We're going to go ahead and we're going to say, oh, this is going to be so hacky. I don't like it. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and give this sphere a new component that says uh, may collide. And I don't like this already uh, because, I mean, we already have a component that says may collide. It's the collider, right? Okay, let's ha oh, let's do this. Let's say has collision effects. That's a little bit better uh, because this is essentially going to, this component is going to allow us to... Um, uh, to uh, do that juicy bounce when we hit the ground. Okay, so here we only care about when we collide with something. So we're going to go on the uh, void on collision enter. Um, and then what we're going to do is we need, in order to do our effect, uh, we need to go ahead and um, we need to grab our uh, our view and we need to go ahead and, and, and see if it has a has hooks effect on it and then we need to perturb it if possible. Okay. Um, so what we should do is we should say, hey, we're going to do spawn view on start uh, view controller. Let's call it that, I guess. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm deeply sorry. This will be so much easier with PubSub. I hope you can feel the pain. Uh, spawn view on start. This spawn view on start component needs to be able to give us uh, the, uh, the view, pre uh, not the view prefab. We don't care about the prefab, uh, but we do care about the... Uh, the actual view that we spawned. Current view, what we'll do is instead of using new view, we'll use current view. Can do a quick replacement everywhere here, should be fine. Um, there we go. Okay, so now we can actually reference current view outside of this component. So we can grab our view controller. If view controller is equal to null, we gotta bail because we can't do anything. Um, and then we need to make sure that our view controller has a view, a current view. Um, if it's equal to null, we're going to do it an early out, as we called it at Maxis. Um, one of the cool things about doing this way of eliminating uh, scenarios and bailing is that if, if a teammate ever wonders what the conditions are for this code working, all they do, go is, do is they just go to the, the uh, start of the function and they just look at the conditions that cause you to bail on the logic, right? Um, this isn't perfect though, because you can run into to nasty bugs uh, where you end up bailing in a certain circumstance where you didn't expect it, okay? So you put code in this function at the bottom and you don't realize that th that code will never run if certain conditions at the top uh, don't work. So that can happen, it's a little bit nasty. Anyway, we're gonna go view controller.current view, we're gonna tell it to perturb. This is not a, a public function though. Actually, we need to we need to do another thing, okay? And so we're gonna to check to make sure our, our view has a hooks law on it. Um, so if view controller.current view dot get component uh, has hooks effect, right? If that is equal to null, we can't do our perturbation, so we're gonna bail. 
And uh, I hope you can see like what the lack of pub sub is doing to this code base right now. You should feel the spaghetti in your heart. Uh, it's certainly uh, I, I certainly am. So let's make uh, let's make this public. <clears throat> and then we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna do this. Can you feel it? Can you feel it, chat? I'm I just uh, I'm I'm embarrassed right now. Hopefully no one clips this. Okay, so we've got the perturb going on, and we are calling it now. So let's go ahead and see what happens. We've only got a few minutes left. Uh, juice can take a while to do, particularly when you're explaining it, but we'll get to the rest of it. We'll do particle systems, and we'll do the rest uh, next time. Um, so let's uh, see what happens. Hey, hey, all right, it works. It's a hack. We're gonna bring in the event bus later, uh, maybe, and we'll fix it up. We'll make it much more decoupled be a whole lot nicer. Anyway, uh, we got like one more minute. So what I want to do is some of you might want to start playing around with particle systems uh, and they're a lot of fun. Uh, they don't work all that well in WebGL or on mobile where I do all my work. So I, I'm not super familiar with them. Um, let's go ahead and it's an effect, right? So it's going to be an effect thing. Let's get a particle system going. You see, we might be at a nighttime, but we're actually in a snowy nighttime, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take this particle system that just started doing stuff. We're going to go ahead and we're going to spin it. No, not that much. Um, 90, there you go. It's coming out in a cone right now with all these snowflakes. So what we'll do is we're going to go to its shape value over here in the inspector. Look at all these different properties we can change. We're going to turn it into a box, okay? That's a very small box. So what we're going to do is we're going to spread it out that way. And we're going to spread it out uh, not that way, this way. The axes are messed up because the parent uh, holding this component is rotated itself. Uh, so now we have this nice snow field. We're going to make it really long. We're going to make it really wide. I don't like how these particles look. Look at this. Oh, actually, it looks kind of good. Um, it's not, uh, they're dying. They're despawning, right? So we're going to raise where they spawn in so the user can't see them spawn in. We're going to lengthen the amount of time they survive for uh, so that we can see them so that they disappear before they start to despawn. I really don't like the fact that these are circles. Uh, and so I'm going to make it all retro. I'm going to go to the render. I'm going to get rid of its default particle system. Can we do that? No, that turns it pink. Let's go ahead and turn it into this. Um, oh, there we go. Let's do sprite default. We now have this really cool uh, pixel snowstorm falling. We can then go ahead and say, oh, there's a little bit of wind to it. you know. So we're going to go ahead and, ooh, that's really cool. We should animate that. Uh, let's, uh, oh, it's coming toward us now. Oh, I don't really want that. It's hard to see. So let's do this. I'm going to take the particle system. We're going to rotate it like this. Uh, maybe, how, what, how does that look? How does that look? That uh, looks kind of mediocre. Let's go ahead and adjust this at the same time we're watching it so we can really uh, get a feel for the effect. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Okay, we need to, this looks unnatural though. So we need the particles to actually go much faster. Starting speed is going to be 20. That looks a lot better, but it's not nearly a thick enough storm. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, you should emit not 10, uh, but 100. By the way, we're now being choked. So um, we cannot have more than a certain number of particles in existence at a time. The max particles uh, value controls that. Ooh, look at this. Wow. Okay. Now we've got a, a thicker storm going on. Naturally, when you have a number like this, you have to push it to the max. You have to push the pedal. And see what happens. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, bump it up to not a hundred, but a thousand. Oh, oh, I'm gonna lose the stream here if we're not careful. Uh, but anyway, it's a pretty cool system. So uh, if your P2 game happens to need snowiness or anything else, I think we can also uh, do some stuff to add noise so it looks more like confetti. You can also just color over time. You can make it collide with stuff and bounce off stuff. There's just so much here. It's a little bit ridiculous. Let's go ahead and add some noise in, see what happens. Uh-oh, uh-oh. That might be it, that might be a uh, rest in peace, chat. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's decrease the amount of particles so that we can actually experiment here without causing a panic on my laptop. Let's go into noise, we're gonna say, you know what, I want the strength to be very high. Whoa, look at this. I feel like there are a bunch of mosquitoes or something, a bunch of flies coming after us. So anyway, you can see how they're kind of bouncing around now. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, motion, kind of random motion to their, their motion. Um, and so it's, it's really neat. There's so many interesting things you could do. You could easily create a nice swarm of flies or something around uh, 
an item or something like that. Uh, if you just uh, maybe, oh, you know, let's get rid of all the motion. I'm very curious what will happen. Well, what happens if we get rid of the motion? I'm guessing, the, look at that. Look at that, chat. It is literally a bunch of flies. We just knocked it out like that. Okay. Anyway, chat, we're at 120 now. You got to go. Uh, and so I'm going to turn the music on. I'll stick around until about probably about 135, give you about 10 minutes. Ask any questions you want. Uh, and I hope you have a fantastic uh, week. Uh, I hope you have a great end to your P2 gold spike. Please stay tuned for a Piazza message on the topic of how our Wednesday lecture lecture will work. On Wednesday, we're going to be doing playtesting sessions, which means you will be assigned a certain number of games that you need to play, provide feedback for, and record footage of too. Footage of you playing the game, so your desktop, as well as your webcam footage so the, the developer can kind of see your reaction and hear you talk, okay? Um, if you don't have a computer that can do these things, let me know, and we'll, uh, we'll just have you do text. Otherwise, I want you to get that high-quality feedback uh, to your peers, okay? Uh, they'll appreciate it a lot. Anyway, team, thank you for joining us. I hope you're excited seeing all this cool, juicy stuff that we can just start experimenting with. Definitely worth investing at least a little bit of time into um, as it can really change someone's first impression and ongoing impression of your project. So take care, everyone. Have a good, uh, good time. Uh, let me throw on some music for us. Okay, chat, go for it. Got any questions? <coughs> Would you all like to see Ellie? Ellie will help, help us answer questions. Ellie's not one for the camera. That's fine. I'm just glad to have her here so I can pet her. Uh, she is an Australian Shepherd. She is the friendliest personality that you've ever met. Uh, she is also, um, and I say this in the most loving way, a complete chicken. Uh, she will run from any fight. Uh, she is not a guard dog. She is a watchdog. So if, uh, if you know, any danger is detected, you know, correctly or incorrectly, she'll make all sorts of noise, but she will not help you confront that danger. Like, if you go to the door, she's going to be 10 feet behind you. You know, who, who knows what could happen? At least that's her thought process. It's, uh, it's a little bit adorable, uh, but a little bit unfortunate. Sometimes. Oh, boy, what a good girl. Oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, it's amazing. We actually got her a, um, so she's she's having a hard time walking sometimes now. Uh, and so we got her a, uh, a bike. Uh, we got her, a, sorry, we got her a, um, a carriage to wheel her around in. Uh, let's do this, uh, uh, what is the brand called? Dog, uh, bike, carriage, carriage, Amazon. She has a strong survival instinct. It's very impressive. Um, it is essentially this, and you can see this this uh, Reggie B imposter right here. Um, mm. Yeah, so that was pretty expensive, but uh, it is it works extremely well. So we take her for bike rides now, and, um, and she uh, she's very happy about that that, that fact. So she will also, uh, whenever she's frightened by anything, you know, like someone drove by, 
um, she will uh, she'll come into my office here and she'll actually go under my desk because it's one of the more secluded areas. Uh, the desk is, is wood, pretty solid wood, so she can uh, kind of hide in here pretty safely. And then she just looks at the door, like she's staring dead center, like intently, no unblinking uh, at the, the door right there. Um, you know, just in case someone comes in, she has to cover her exit, right? Uh, she is, she's not a, a rescue. Uh, uh, she was, uh, yeah, uh, definitely, uh, she was, uh, uh, I'm, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you call it, but she was not a rescue. Uh, she does need to be rescued on occasion, though, uh, because whenever a thunderstorm hits, if a thunderstorm or fireworks happen, she's in the bathtub. She runs to my, uh, my parents' room, jumps in the bathtub, hides in there. It's the cutest, saddest thing you've ever seen. It's great. We also have really good, uh, really nice windows. I'll actually show you. So she loves to be in this room to look out the windows. Um, oh. I'm not sure if you can see that, but she she really likes to uh, look out the out the windows, kind of keep her surveillance going. It's just more effective out, out in, in this room. Okay, so a complete gameplay loop, and I believe the, 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 the assignment spec kind of explains what this means. Um, but games tend to work in a certain way, um, where you know you start the game, as in you launch the application in your operating system, and the game starts, you start playing it, it ends, and then it goes back to the start of the game, and you play it, and it ends, and you go back to the start of the game, and you play it, and it ends, right? And that loop, sometimes that loop is going back to the title screen. Sometimes that loop is just retrying a stage, right? So it's a smaller loop. Um, but you really, you really don't want a loop where the game, the, you start the application, you play it for a while, and the game just never ends. And so the, the player's only way to restart is to kill the game. And this can happen a lot. This happens a lot with student games and with uh, games that are very early in development where um, it just kind of it, it, it crashes out or the game is expected to soft lock. No game should ever be expected to soft lock or be forced to be kind of quit out, kind of hard quit, like go into task manager, kill the program. Um, and so one of the first things that we need to do is we need to establish the loop. Even if the loop is extremely tiny, even if the game loop is literally one stage, even if it's literally 30 seconds, you establish the game loop so that the player can play as many times as they want without quitting the actual application. And then your entire objective for your development process is to fill up that game loop and stretch it and make it longer, fill it with better content, right? Uh, fill it with a more meaningful loop so that people want to play multiple times. Um, and so we need to get that loop established as fast as we can. We need to get the beginning of the game set up, we need to get the end of the game set up, and then we can fill the middle with all this juicy, amazing content and all these great decisions, okay? Uh, to engage the player. Um, so essentially it's just kind of, it's, it's a good habit. It's a good process habit when you're making a game. Just get that loop finished as fast as you can. Um, because it's hard to show off if you don't have that loop established, right? Like you don't want to give a playtester a game that's just gonna soft lock and they can literally only play it once. Like, how can they give you good feedback if they only have one chance to play it, you know? Should the gold spike mechanic just be the most difficult part of our game to implement or should it focus on our novel mechanic? Like, usually these will be the same thing because a mechanic that is easy to implement will usually not be very novel because it's easy to implement, therefore, chances are much higher people have done it already. So usually these two are, are the same thing or very related. Um, but your gold spike mechanic, um, uh, it should be the most challenging. 
you know, it's kind of a cross. You can choose, in other words, um, because the most important mechanic in your game is probably going to be kind of tricky to implement, or it's going to take some time, because it's the most important thing, right? It's the thing you have to get right. Um, so you can probably choose which one you consider your gold spike. The important thing, though, is to tell us which feature is your gold spike, so we know how to grade your project, you know? Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I hope that was useful. If, if that's still confusing, you can uh, shoot me a question on Discord or something. Two minutes. Um, what if I just found a YouTube video that has my novel mechanic in it? Um, it's a bad feeling for sure. Um, but here's something to consider. Usually, even if two games have a very similar mechanic, it often has a very different feel because it was implemented differently or it was balanced differently um, or, you know, the, it, that mechanic appears in a different context. So the stages are different. They put different emphasis on different things. So it's very rare that a mechanic will be literally the same thing. And here's another thing. Um, there are a billion games out there. There are countless titles. And many of them are hard to find. They're obscure. It would be unreasonable for us to expect that you've played every game that has ever been made, right? And so what we expect from you is that you you avoid mechanics that are mainstream, that are appearing often in big games. And if it appears in like an obscure indie title, you know, whatever. Take your mechanic and try and find a way, if you did find your mechanic in a YouTube video, try and find a way to tweak it or balance it a little bit to be a little bit unique, right? Um, because you, you, once you discover that your mechanic has already been done, you want to change it, right? Because you want to try out something that you know you don't know if it'll work. You know, so uh, tweak it a little bit, balance it to be a little bit different than what you see in that other game, and you're probably going to be fine for novelty. Okay, does anyone else have any questions? Okay, awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Uh, I hope the, uh, the juice lecture was a little bit useful and uh, I hope you have a fantastic time on P2. Okay, I look forward to playing your P2 Gold Spikes soon. Uh, and uh, yeah, have a safe and healthy couple of days. And we'll see you on Wednesday, okay? Bye-bye.